Welcome to last lecture, DG Mushu. It's, it's been a rough ride, but th thank, you, thank you for sticking with us the entire semester. Okay, all right, man, I appreciate it. All right, so uh, we have a lot to cover. Um, as, as I said in last class, uh, we're live streaming this, and we have a Zoom call also enabled where, again, people uh, outside of CMU can call and chime in and ask for questions. Uh, my number one PT student, Wan, is managing the line, uh, so he'll be unmuting people and asking questions as we go along, but of course, I'll give preference to everyone here in the room. But for, the, for those of you that are enrolled in the class, I quickly want to go through the, the final exam for what's coming up with you guys. Again, project four is going to be due this Sunday coming up. We're having the Saturday office hours, obviously the Saturday and the 10th uh, at 3 p.m., and that'll be in those two locations there. The final exam will be on the 16th, so one week plus one day from now, 1 p.m. That'll be in uh, gates 4401 on, on the, the main floor. Um, the study guide is already posted. I'll, I'll have a link to this. That's, that's, that's a typo. Okay? All right, so let's fire through this quickly. Also, too, uh, Cuddy is teaching the, the same class, uh, 445, 645, next semester. Um, so he's also looking for TAs. So if you liked what you've done in this class, if you really like C++, you really love Bus Tub, uh, then by all means, uh, you know, volunteer and sign up for that. And then there's a form, as I posted on Piazza, where if you have interest, uh, you can sign up and he'll reach out to you. Okay? Course evaluations are always, uh, always appreciated. Uh, my, my impression is that the, the, the master students always say, like, oh, this class is the greatest thing I've ever had. But the undergrads are always more cutting and saying, like, this, you know, this sucks or whatever you are. So, like, I, I appreciate feedback like that. And we do listen and we do try to make things better, right? And, yes, I know B plus trees are hard. They're meant to, it's, you know, it's, that's not going away, right? Nothing we can do for that, okay? Uh, so whatever you licked and don't like, please, please give us feedback. Actually, one, one year a kid gave me a psychoanalysis. Uh, so I, that I appreciated, yes, like whatever, the, the Briggs-Meyer thing. Um, so again, be brutal, I don't care. Uh, next week, I'll have office hours, additional office hours in, in, uh, in uh, leading up to the exam. So on Tuesday, I'll be in my office from 1230 to 1.30. On Thursday night, uh, I'll do that over Zoom virtually. And then as always, you can sign up through that calendar link if you need to meet me at, at a different time or just send me an email. I'm happy to make myself available uh, b before the exam, okay? And all the TAs will have their regular office hours, I guess today, tomorrow, and, on, and then on Saturday. And then they won't have any office hours unless we announce them on Piazza next week, okay? All right, so <coughs> final exam. Um, so who has to take it? You guys. Uh, why? Well, that link will answer all your questions. Um, if you need any special accommodations, uh, please email me uh, sooner uh, rather than later. So therefore, we can make, sure, make the, the proper arrangements with the disability office or, or other things, OK? So uh, what to bring? I need your ID. Please bring a pencil and eraser. I will try to bring erasers this time uh, for, for people that forget them. Uh, you can use, bring a calculator. Uh, it won't be probably not necessary for this exam, but if you, if you want that backup, it's there. Using your cell phone is OK because it's 2022. And then like last time, we'll do a single sheet of paper, handwritten notes, double-sided. Uh, so again, don't take copies of the slides and try to, try to shrink them down. The exercise of actually writing it out will be, you'll, you'll absorb more. Um, somebody complained last time about NFT clothing somebody was wearing. Don't, so don't, just don't wear a hat or whatever, something stupid, okay? I'm, I'm not here to police clothing. It's just I'm trying to accommodate everyone, okay? So as always, as, as people were this before, what do you need to know before the midterm? All right, so what, what material for before the midterm do you need to know for the final exam? Uh, again, we're not going to ask you. Sorry, yes. Can you repeat the question one more time? Well, my point is you, you, well, this slide basically is saying that you're not going to need the one for the midterm. Right? We're not going to ask you, like, it's not going to be like, what, is the jo what does this join cost? Right? It's like if you don't understand what a buffer pool does and how it interacts with the rest of the system, then you have problems. And, but like the low level details of, of like LRUK and so forth, that's not necessary for the final. It's basically the, the midterm, like, but it covers the material from, from the, the midterm to the end, okay? Again, so again, just repeating what I said now, just, just said, you don't need to, you don't have to know the exact details of all the algorithms to everything we discussed before the midterm, but of course the high level ideas of how these all fit together into a database management system are, are necessary and important, okay? All right, so we talked about, I want to go through quickly the main sort of topics that we talked about and sort of hitting the high points or the, the key ideas that I want you guys to, to understand. Um, so we talked about query optimization, like how to take a SQL query 
it gets parsed into a logical plan, and then there's a bunch of transformations we can do on that to put it into an optimized physical plan form. So we talked about uh, some basic heuristics we could do without a cost model, like predicate pushdown, projection pushdown, simple rewriting of nested queries. Uh, we talked a little bit about statistics and how to track these in, 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 uh, in uh, histograms. The formulas of having to do cardinality estimation, I didn't teach that. We don't need to worry about that. Um, but then again, the high level idea of how you do a cost-based search, right? The, the top down versus bottom up. Just again, at a high level understanding the pros and cons of these different approaches. No, sorry. The, like, heck, it's more like the idea of cardinality estimation from histograms, not like how do, how do you derive the formulas for it, like w for this predicate versus that predicate. Or like, th you know, th there's, uh, there could be correlated statistics and things like that that could cause problems. All right, uh, we talked a lot, spent a lot of time on transactions. Obviously, understand what asset is. We spent a lot of time talking about conflict serializability, why this was the gold standard of what we want to achieve in our data management system. But we need to figure out how do we can check for this? How can we ensure that something is serializable? Um, the use serializability, again, is, is this high-level concept of, of that it's, it's uh, in the sort of the, the universe of schedules. It's broader than conflict serializable, but we can't actually check for it efficiently in a system. So again, just understanding maybe what the, the difference between conflict serializability and view serializability is. And the main, the main example was the blind writes. It's like if you do blind writes, then it can be view serializable, but it may not be conflict serializable. Uh, actually, we didn't cover recoverable schedules. That, that's a typo, so ignore that. Uh, we spent time talking about isolation levels, anomaly detection, uh, or, or, or not, how about anomalies, phantoms, how to check for phantoms or prevent phantoms. Right, you should be aware of, of all these things. For concurrency of your protocols uh, with uh, two-phase locking, understand the difference between rigorous and non-rigorous, uh, how we do deadlock detection, weights for wound and weight, uh, or deadlock prevention. Uh, and then, or th those are examples of deadlock pre prevention. And then we spend a lot of time talking about the different granularity, le granularity levels or, or, or in locks. So you could have uh, intention locks, shared intention locks, right? understanding how that, all that tree works together. Basically, the, the kind of stuff you did in, in project four. Then we talked about timestamp ordering protocols, so understand what the Thomas Wright rule, what that optimization does, how OCC works. Again, will we explicit whether we're doing forwards validation or backwards validation, and any question. And then the high level ideas of between, uh, behind MVCC. Like what does it mean to have a different version, or multi versions, how do you actually organize this, represent this represent, store this in, in the system, uh, why do you need to do garbage collection, and so forth. Understand like, what, what snapshot isolation provides you, Right, and why does MVCC is, is intrinsically linked to that? Then we talked about how to do crash recovery. So we talked about different powerful policies: steel versus no steel, force versus no force. Right, steel means that you can evict a page from the buffer pool uh, from a transaction that has not committed yet. No steel says you can't do that, and force says you have to require a transaction to have all its dirty pages written to disk before you can say it's committed. But no force does not require that. And so right ahead logging was the key idea we were going to use to provide uh, durability in our system. And that's a, that's a steel no force policy, right? We can, we can write out dirty pages out to disk before the transaction commits, but we require to write the log entry out to disk first. Let's make sure that's been flushed. Uh, we spent a little time talking about like, logging schemes. Again, high level ideas, logical versus physical, and what are the pros and cons. And then we spent a whole lecture on Aries. And so basic understanding how to log sequence numbers uh, work with um, keeping track of when things are written out and how do we do recovery and, and redo and undo. And then lastly, we spent time talking about uh, distributed databases. So again, high level idea understanding of the system architectures, shared disk versus sh shared nothing. What are the pros and cons of, of, of each of them? How are we gonna support replication? So either you know, uh, primary replica or you know, writer, writer reader approach versus the, the multi, multi primary approach, or multi home approach, different kind of partitioning schemes, like horizontal partitioning, how to break things up. Uh, and then we spent a lot of time talking about two phase commit. How do we sure to make sure that transactions uh, all agree that they're going to, uh, they're all going to agree that they're going to commit something uh, when a transaction finishes up. Also missing for this, uh, for, the, for the join algorithms as well, like how the different scenarios of when you want to do a broadcast join versus a shuffle join. All right, so the questions that are not going to be in the exam, because uh, P, P of S, 
Uh, so the Snowflake lecture, that was a guest lecture. That was meant for you guys just to understand how this all fits together. That well, I'm obviously not gonna ask questions like, what does Snowflake do? Because that's a bad question. Um, the last lecture was on embedded logic. Uh, and since there wasn't, a, a, there wasn't a project on it, wasn't a homework on it, it doesn't seem fair to actually test you on this. So don't worry about that. And then uh, any specific details or any information that I've shared throughout the semester about how one specific database system does something uh, is, is, not, is not applicable for the exam. So I'm not gonna ask you like, hey, how does Postgres do X or how does MySQL do this? Right, that, that's a low level factoid that, um, again, it, it's just color commentary for the material in the semester. Okay? All right, any questions about any of this? Okay, again, Friday next week, one o'clock in, in, in Gates. Okay? How long are we gonna see about the slides? Well, we're gonna read two YouTube comments, but yeah, go for it. What's the widest of the slides that you can cover? What's the what? What's the link? Yeah, the, the, the wide YouTube link. Oh, the YouTube link? Yeah. Uh, that explains databases. All right. All right, so, um, so let's do this. All right, so I don't have an agenda. I don't have any prepared slides. Uh, there was two questions we had uh, that, that students put ahead of time uh, that we can go over. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a, uh, I don't have like, a, you know, here's the things we're gonna get through. So. I guess we'll maybe open up to the audience first. Does anybody have a question, like any database question you want to ask, uh, and I'll be unfiltered and I'll, and I'll tell you anything. Or we can go to the prepared questions. Yes? I've, you always say that MySQL is SQL Server or like SQL DBs. Yes. Right? But why is like, but are you sponsored by Microsoft? <laughs> okay, <laughs> no, <laughs> keep going. Yeah. Okay. Uh, and what is, so it's not, it's not why exactly is that, why exactly do you say that it's SQL Server? Okay, so his question is, uh, and actually let me do, let me share screen, or let me du duplicate screen, make sure this doesn't break. Um, and I gotta fix this, sorry. Okay, yeah, that's the problem with this mic. Um, nope, display capture. There we go, that's what I want, okay, perfect. Uh, so yeah, I can't, there's nothing I can do to boost the audio. Um, doing this live is a bad idea, so let's not, I, it, it is what it is. Um, all right, so his question is, because I want this, I want to be able to like, draw and write as we go along. His question is, why do I keep saying Microsoft is state of the art, and am I getting paid off by them to say this? Uh, so, so, um, all right, so Microsoft SQL Server. As I, as I said throughout the semester, uh, I said, said this a couple times, um, Microsoft didn't originally write SQL Server themselves. So there was another system from the 1980s called Sybase, uh, which was a you know, startup in the 1980s, um, that Microsoft actually licensed the source code late 80s, early 90s to then port Sybase to Windows NT so that they could have a, you know, a database system running on, on Windows. Um, Again, it all leads back to Stonebreaker. Sybase was founded by a guy named Bob Epstein. Bob Epstein was an early employee, and I think he was at Berkeley as well, working on Ingress, which was Stonebreaker's first database system. Right? So it's all, it all comes back to Mike. Um, so then in the night, so, so, they, so Microsoft licensed Sybase. I think they rebranded at the time to, I think they called it SQL Server right away. Um, and then over time, they end up uh, just doing a complete rewrite. And when they did the rewrite, they, they, uh, they made a, a pretty significant changes to the architecture to, to, to modernize it uh, at the time, the late 90s. But then also since then, they've, had, they've done some major, major changes to the architecture in ways that I think is the right way to build a database system. So, uh, so in particular, one of the things they did was switch to what's called a Cascades query optimizer. Um, so this is a, this is a top-down approach where you, they throw every, all the decisions you can make about what the, uh, what transformations you can make for the query plan is all done in a sort of this single unified search, search model. Uh, and they do all sorts of things that I wouldn't even think you could do, uh, but like they do things like transformations to ensure that you don't violate the Halloween problem. So they would know, like that's just another rule to say, is this, is this query plan gonna cause problems for this, this you know, for the Halloween problem, for example. 
and they can have a rule to make sure that it doesn't happen rather than having sort of special checks later in a sort of separate code pass. So they have a unified query optimizer and the research shows that they achieve, uh, they generate more optimal plans than everyone else when you have multiple joins. It's not perfect, right, because that's super hard, but they, they do better than SQL, or they do better than Oracle, do better in DB2, do better, much better in Postgres, right? So for the research, current research shows that, that SQL Service Query Optimizer is better than everyone else. And I think it's partly due because of Cascades, right? Uh, and, they, they, and they decided to do this like from the beginning when they did the rewrite, like, okay, let's build a real query optimizer, right? Oracle took like 15 years to try, like, try, to, try to build one, right? Um, the other big, I think, uh, innovation they did is this thing called SQL OS. So 2005, 2004, or 2005, yeah, 2004, 2005, they decided to rewrite the execution layer or the sort of the underlying substrate of the, the, the database system to abstract away the hardware and the operating system. And then it's this thing called SQL OS. And basically what that means is that instead of making like low level libc or I guess with Win32 Win syscalls to like read things from a disk or schedule threads and so forth, they have this thing called SQL OS that abstracts all that away and allows them to have, um, uh, to hide the complexities of maybe where hardware, how, what, what the hardware looks like, where data is actually located, uh, and so that the upper levels of the system don't need to know, like, am I reading something in this NUMA region versus another NUMA region, or from this disk versus that disk, or what the hardware, what the CPU can support. SQL OS hides all of that from you. Uh, as part of this, they also rewrote it to use uh, uh, user-level code routines. So, like, you every every task or thread runs for a little bit. It then yields back to this schedule that in SQL OS, and then they can decide at that moment, should it rerun you again? If you're waiting for a lock, should not try to schedule you again? Because again, the OS doesn't know any of these things, the data system does, so they can make all these decisions, uh, you know, make these decisions like better than, than what the, the kernel can do, right? So, the, so in addition to using coroutines and this unified architecture, this allows them, well, as part of this unified architecture uh, or, or layer, as new hardware comes out, they don't have to rewrite all the upper parts of the system. They just have to modify the SQL OS thing. Then in 2016, when uh, you know Balmer left and they had the, the new CEO at Microsoft, and they said, okay, well, we can support Linux now because that's super important. When they ported SQL Server to Linux, it wasn't a huge rewrite because all they had to do was change the SQL OS layer because all the Windows, Windows specific code was in this thing, not the upper level parts of the system. So they were able to port it to Linux pretty quickly uh, without any real you know, major rewrites, major, major changes. So for this reason, and then um, they, uh, they've, add, they've added column storage, they've added vectorized execution, they had an in-memory query engine. They've done a lot of things to extend the database system to support uh, you know, new types of workloads in a way that I think is, is more elegant than what other systems have done. So again, do I get paid for Microsoft? No. Uh, we, we've, we've never gotten any money out of them. Hold on, is that true? Sort of. Uh, my, first year at, yeah, my first year at CMU, I did get a small amount of money from my, one of my first students, uh, but not, you know, not to the level of, of other companies that sponsor my research. So I'm not getting paid by them. All right. I, I, I still think this is the best, how do you say this? It's the best enterprise system. It, it, it's probably the best uh, because, again, it's not sta hasn't stagnated. They're making a, it's 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 well in, in implemented, uh, and it's worth Linux. Yeah. Yes. What I'm trying to show is like you alluded to that really big startup in San Francisco. Yes. Can you sort of explain the reasoning why San Francisco is a really big startup? All right. So the question is, um, why Postgres for startups? So Postgres is a great workhorse system, right? Is it the most efficient? No. Is it the, uh, is it the fastest database system? No. But for most, for 99% of the people out there and new startups, Postgres is the way to go. Because in the very beginning, you don't have any data. You don't have any users of your startup. Uh, and again, unless you're doing analytics, that's, we'll talk about that separately. Uh, that you don't want to spend time figuring out, oh, what database system should I use, so forth. 
if you pick Postgres, like that's a great choice and it'll handle most, most of your, your, your use case in the very beginning of your company. Then over time, if you get users and you get data and you start pushing Postgres in a way that it doesn't want to go or it can't, can't keep up, at that point you have money to then pay someone like me or somebody who takes this class to go figure out what the right system you want to use. And maybe it is just scaling out to a distributed version of Postgres, right? Or maybe it's offloading some pieces of Postgres and, and, and through new partitioning. Um, and so I would say is like, the reason why I always recommend Postgres is because it's, it's a well-implemented system that has a lot of advanced features that the SQL servers and oracles would have and charge a lot of money for, but you get that in Postgres. It follows the, the SQL standard reasonably well. Uh, it has well-known behaviors, so you're not gonna, maybe there's corner cases, but like you're not gonna get like some weird bug or some like, you know, some issue that only you have and nobody else knows how to solve. And you don't spend time in your startup where time and money are precious, thinking out what data system to use and how to, how to maintain it, you worry about the thing that actually is gonna make your company different or su survive, right? Like who cares that like your, whatever your, your web three thing or whatever some bullshit thing, oh, okay, I'm not supposed to cut, sorry. Um, <laughs> what, whatever your like, your startup idea is, no one's gonna care, oh, it's running Postgres versus Mongo. If it's up, it's up and, and like you can do the things that's, that's, gonna, that's gonna matter. And then as you start hitting scaling problems, you know, Postgres will scale vertically far, far enough and, there's, and there's, there's ways to get by without having to, uh, you know, to put everything into to, to one giant database. But I think it's a better decision to do this, get all the, 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 the goodness of, of relational model, SQL, a, a well, um, you know, a, uh, a great ecosystem of tool, tools and not instead of trying some random thing that like it's the hot thing on Hacker News, right? Back in the day, this is like 10 years ago or so, when I was still in grad school, uh, I remember going to a Halloween party in some bar in San Francisco. And then as soon as you tell someone you do, do databases in San Francisco, everyone wants to talk to you, right? And at the time, like, you know, everyone's like, oh, it was, it was like Twitter apps or it was all like trying to gamify stuff. That was the hot thing back then. Um, and I remember at this bar, I had like four people tell me, yeah, I got a startup. We're using Mongo. And I was asking why were they going to pick Mongo? And then, oh, because it does auto sharding. And I was like, great, how big is your database? Oh, I don't know, a couple hundred megs. Like, but we're gonna get big, right? So, so Mongo, Mongo's big selling point was at the time was that they would be able to scale your database for you. So they picked an inferior system because it had this one feature that they're ever never gonna need, right? Now, of course, one of those companies failed, like they never get there, right? So by picking Postgres, you can, you can punt, the, punt the decision down the road of how to make it scale and focus on the application but at least you know that if you follow the relational model and, and design, have good, uh, well-designed schemas, you know, a year from now, you're not like, this data's all shit, it's all dirty and it's all messy. Like, cause the data system will maintain this integrity for you. So that's why I always say use Postgres. Now, if it's analytics, you gotta go to a Snowflake or a Databricks or a ClickHouse, like, like or, or, or BigQuery or so forth. Um, like, and I'm not saying that cause Snowflake sponsors the class, so Snowflake is a good system. We use it for, for AutoTune. Um, like, that's a different thing. You definitely don't wanna use Postgres for that. All right, when, a any callers? Can you hear me? Fail to check your speaker. Oh, all right, well. well that's a disappointing. All right, Robert, do you have a question? Go for it. Oh, I'm, I'm muted, maybe that's why I'm muted. All right, when, any questions? Yep. Lots of questions. Okay. Uh, you're in on line one. All right, line one. All right, go for it. Question, go for it, yes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Um, so I'm wondering whether uh, 15721 will be offered next semester, and if so, will everything, like the project and the lectures oh, be? Maybe that's why I'm muted. All right, Wayne, any questions? Uh, <laughs> yep, lots of questions. All right, cool. Question is 15721, is it offered next semester? Yes. Am I teaching it? Yes. Will everything be on YouTube? Yes. Will everything be available in Gradescope to people not at CMU? Yes. Uh, well, okay. What will the projects be? I don't know quite yet. Probably on Postgres. Nice, thank you. All right, Wayne, other questions? Yep, uh, Gavin. What line? Line two. All right, All right go for it. Hey, uh, can you hear me, Andy? Yes. 
All right. Um, yeah, so my question is, do you think that uh, multi-core or concurrent programming is going to become more important uh, part of database education in the future? Because now every, almost everything is multi-core and single-threaded code is, uh, you know, not super efficient. So, you know, concepts like efficient synchronization and NUMA seem increasingly important. But do I think it's, it's important? Absolutely. Uh, do I think we already teach this? In the advanced class, we certainly do. Um, yeah, so I think hardware is going to get wild. So his question is like, how important is multi-core systems for, for databases? Super important, right? Uh, but a lot of the same techniques that we taught through this, through this semester, maybe they were, they were originally derived or, uh, or created in a time when, uh, you know, we didn't have, you know, multi-core CPUs, but they're still relevant, still, still matter today. So current control is a good example of this. Back in the 1970s, it was these uniprocessors had a single core, and you need to make sure that if one transaction stalled because it went to disk, then you, uh, you want to make sure that they don't interfere with another transaction running at the same time, right? You would allow concurrent uh, transactions run, run together even though you only had a single core. In a modern system with a lot, or CPU with a lot of cores, uh, now you, have, you, you want to have parallelism because you have the hardware available, so you still have to use the two-phase locking or the OCC or the MCC stuff we talked about to prevent two threads running into two separate transactions at the same time from, from interfering with each other. So absolutely, all the stuff we talked about this semester uh, matter. And then we'll see in the advanced class how to parallelize a bunch of the, the algorithms we talked about to do joins, scans, and other things in, in greater detail. Harvard's going to get wild this, 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 this decade. I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, you know, uh, Intel sort of sees the writing on the wall. They're pushing x86 as far as they can. Uh, the RISC-V stuff looks interesting. The ARM stuff looks interesting. AMD is throwing stuff out there. Do I think it's going to be GPUs? No. Do I think it's going to be FPGAs? Maybe for some things. Uh, but there might be an additional accelerators on, on the die itself, on the CPU. So we want to de design systems for that. Now, going back to what I said about SQL OS and Microsoft SQL Server, the SQL OS layer allows them to, again, exploit whatever the new hardware comes out as it comes along, rather than have to go and rewrite a bunch of the different parts of the, of, of, of the upper levels of the system, the query executor, to, to use it. And I think that's, they did a lot of work, engineering work, that's, gonna pay, that, that's paying off in the long term that makes their system future-proof in a way that other systems aren't. Again, I'm not being paid by them. <laughs> All right, other questions? Yeah. Sorry, I actually had a question with the white box and the single slot. So what are your plans for like middle slot and single slot? Because like, I, I mean, maybe like in the sky of the world, I mean, the big trend today is also you know, to do more like uh, middle slot and single slot stuff. But then now it's just kind of like faded out a little bit. Yes. Know? Like, I have personal opinions, but I want to hear what your opinions are. So the question is, what is my opinion? Why no, no sequel versus sequel, right? So I actually just wrote a paper with, with uh, Stonebreaker uh, discussing this, this analysis um, or analyzing this trend. So basically what happens in, the, in databases is that every 10 years, something comes along that people are like, oh, SQL is stupid. Relational model is stupid. It doesn't fit for my application. Here's a better way of doing it. And then before Hacker News, I guess it was whatever else, like trade magazines, there's a lot of hype around it. People try to start using it, and then they realize, oh, this, this is a mistake, and they come back to realizing that SQL and relational model is a good idea. So that's where we're at right now. No SQL was a hot thing 10 years ago. Uh, MongoDB was at the forefront of this. Um, and then Cassandra from Facebook and, and DataStacks. Redis is another one. Um, there's a bunch of these other NoSQL systems uh, that, have, I mean, they're still around, but they're not either dead or on life support. Um, so the NoSQL guys, they made a lot of claims about, well, they were sort of targeting, uh, they were targeting at the time a workload of like for new internet applications where you need to be highly available, always online, and you needed to worry about scale. And they were correct to point out that the sort of the legacy SQL relational model data systems at the time couldn't scale and made design choices that favored uh, you know, consistency and, and, and data integrity over availability, right? So we talked about before, like if you, with the cap theorem stuff, like a, a, a traditional SQL data system, if a bunch of machines go down or there's a network partition, you stop running any transactions until you can, the network comes back and you can make sure that everyone's in sync because you don't want to have a, the split brain problem. 
some of the NoSQL systems say, like, well, it's better to serve any data even if it's not, uh, it's not correct because they always want to be available. Um, and they assume that some programmer is going to come along and, and fix things later, which is a hard thing to do. It didn't always happen. So a lot of claims were made about uh, how these NoSQL systems were, were significantly superior to, to the Postgres, MySQLs, and, and traditional database systems at the time. Um, but it turns out all the things we talked about at the very beginning of the semester like, that the relational model provides, like data integrity, reference integrity, uh, a de declarative, query query yeah, declarative query language that operates on, on sets of data rather than like a low-level programming language, all that stuff that we talked at the beginning matters. And if you're building real applications, uh, you may get some quick engineering wins if you don't follow these things, but it's a long-term, you're going you're to have problems. And so the, 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 the conventional wisdom has come back around that SQL and relational model are, uh, are the right way to go. And all these systems, except for Redis, and Redis is primarily used for a cache, all these NoSQL systems now some, support some, some, something that looks like SQL and the relational model. Like Cassandra used to be, they, they, they'd want to use like a Thrift API to, to read and write data. Now they say, no, no, they have their own version of SQL called CQL. But like, that's a superficial distinction. It, it basically is SQL. It's basically the relational data system now. So over time, the NoSQL systems are adopting a lot of the features that the relational database systems had, had, had before, at the beginning, transaction, SQL, and, and, you know, uh, and, and strong consistency. And they're slowly adding these things. And so in a few years, the difference between SQL and the NoSQL systems, loosely categorized, and the SQL systems is going to be immaterial. They're basically going to look exactly the same because they're all going to be relational database systems. Um, Redis is a holdout because, again, it's, it's used for, for caching. But you wouldn't, I'm sure people put their entire database to, you know, on it. The, the, the Redis Labs guys or the, the Redis startups trying to get people to convince people to do that. Um, but no, no, I, don't, I don't see it. SQL was here before everyone, before, SQL was here before all of us were born, and it's going to be here when we all die. Is it going to look exactly, is it gonna look exactly as it does now? No, because over time it's going to adopt a lot of the features that get, that these other new data come along and start adding, we it, it absorbs them, right? JSON was the hot thing that JSON that the MongoDB supported. They could store you know JSON documents natively. Well, everyone pretty much has a JSON type now. So is is how's that better then? That was a long-winded answer. Okay, yes. Your question is, um, so your, your question is, is what's the next hardware bottleneck? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I so I, I would say I made the incorrect uh, prediction ten years ago that disk was going to be the huge bottleneck. And I spent a lot of my early years in grad school, or all my time in grad school and, and early years at, at CMU, uh, trying to build in-memory database systems where you don't have a buffer pool, you assume everything fits into memory. Um, and this is because you know I was listening to like the, the DRAM manufacturers are like, oh yeah, the flash guys aren't gonna be able to scale, it's not gonna get faster, they're gonna, they're gonna hit you know, serious bottlenecks. But that didn't happen, I was wrong. And disk got really fast, really cheap, uh, a pretty large bandwidth, like PCI six is like the numbers you can get is pretty significant. Um, so I then also uh, put my heavy bets on uh, the Optane stuff, persistent memory, um, Intel's Optane, where like I was like, all right, well, again, Flash is is not going to be king. This 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 pr thing that looks like DRAM but is actually persistent like Flash. That's the way everyone's going to build data systems. And I, I was like envisioning, oh, like in 2025, all the stuff we talk about in this class about buffer pools and, and volatile memory, that goes away because this thing solves all that, right? But of course, as I said, Intel killed that, right? So that's not, no one's going to try this for another 10 years at least, right? Because uh, if Intel can't do it, then who can? Um, I think the next bottleneck is going to be, uh, it's going to be the bandwidth between memory and CPU. Um, and then also the CPU itself. Uh, 
you know, Intel is, squeaks out a lot of you know, good performance through additional cores, through SIMD, uh, but at the end of the day, you gotta get data on it. Um, and when you look at a lot of the papers uh, on like how to do high performance hash joints and so forth, like they're at the level where they're counting cycles um, to get things off of the cache into, you know, into registers. Uh, and so I think that's the next, that's the next, uh, I think that's the next, that, that's the next hardware bottleneck to deal with, right? Sure, the, the network's, and the network's getting really fast too, right? Um, so there is a line of research um, called PIM processing in memory. There is some, um, there is some harbor, I think this, this exists, you can get this now, I've, there, it's, it's definitely in the literature, but there's methods where you, there's like, there's hardware where you can actually have computational units on DRAM itself. Similarly, we talked about how there's an SSD where you can get the ARM cores at the bottom and, and do, basically do predicate pushdown that we talked about before. Uh, and so there is uh, hardware where you can start pushing some of the predicate execution into memory itself. Then, and then you avoid that, that bottleneck. Um, now the question is, do you need, the question would be, do you need to design an entire brand new database system to use this, or could you take Postgres and extend it, or take, take another existing system and extend it to support this? Um, I, don't, so I don't think for, for this hardware, I don't think you need a whole brand new system. I convinced myself that if you wanted to do Optane, you wouldn't need a brand new system. Like, cause you can't just like rip out the buffer pool in Postgres and think everything's gonna be okay. It's a, it's a complete re-architecting. Um, and so uh, an another trend's gonna be in the next decade is hardware accelerators for databases. Um, this, is, this is an old thing. I, my handwriting's terrible, sorry. Um, since the 1980s, late 70s, 1980s, people have recognized, oh, the bottleneck of the database is either disk or memory or network or GPU. So people had to try to build customized hardware. Uh, it never works. Uh, it was, sorry, let me rephrase that. It, it'll work, but it never gets enough traction in the marketplace where it makes this a viable option and sustainable. So uh, what I'm trying to say is any customized hardware for spe built specifically for databases will be a failure, except for very niche things, uh, like one-off things. But again, that's not a huge market, right? Um, the GPUs and FPGAs, those sort of general purpose uh, hardware accelerators, I think those are a safer bet, but again, they have other limitations that we talked about before, where I don't think this is gonna happen. So what I'm trying to say is I think the next decade of hardware for databases is gonna be very interesting that people are gonna propose accelerators. They're never gonna get anywhere uh, if, if they're like a startup or an outside company. And people are gonna instead look to like things like FPGAs to build stuff. Now. The only exception will be uh, the cloud vendors because they have the money, they have the resources, and they have the scale where this actually makes sense. So this is not a secret, but uh, Google builds, they have custom hardware to do in BigQuery to do in-memory shuffles. Like they have a machine that can do the, the, sh the sorting or shuffling of data when you're doing distributed queries. They have specialized hardware for that. Amazon had something in Redshift called Aqua. I think they ended up killing it, but they had basically uh, what they're, they're, of course, they're going to try it again. They're going to have specialized hardware that does specific things for, for Redshift stuff. Because they can do it because they have all the money and at their scale, spending $100 million to make something significantly faster and cheaper is a big win for them. But anybody that's like, hey, I have a startup, we're building a hardware accelerator for databases, I don't see happening. It's not viable. Yes? Is that because the reason the last 10 years we gone back from in memory database to instruction? Yes. So last 10 years of research. Uh, I mean, the Optane, so the, the, the persistent memory stuff, I, I'm not saying it was like, it wasn't wasted work in that like, um, like I, I, you know, I'm on, my, on my deathbed, I'm gonna regret it. It was really interesting. It's, I mean, it's a really different way to think about how you build a database system. Like, memory's not volatile anymore. What does that mean? Uh, well, like if, I, if I'm if i running a transaction that's updating pages of memory and I crash and come back, 
what like what's there, right? Like how do you deal with that? The answer is multi versioning, like because you don't want to over things overwrite. But there's other design choices you have to make in a system. So I, I don't regret I don't regret the the persistent memory work we've done. Um, my uh, my second PhD student Dana, she went off and did did Autotune with me. So that was obviously a good idea. Um, the I think what I sort of wasted time on. Um, I mean, there's other areas that I find interesting, but it doesn't necessarily mean I'd go do them. Uh, I think the log structure research is, is kind of interesting. Um, that that the processing in memory stuff I think is interesting, but I just didn't do it. Yeah, I don't. Other than sort of one-off projects that didn't kind of go the way I had hoped, uh, I don't think I have any major regrets. Yeah. All right, Wayne. Any any questions on 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 the on the question on line three, level hundred? All right, go for it. Call, are you there? Yeah, uh, I'm here. Uh, yeah. So I was wondering, um, do you think Biggie would have used PostgreSQL or MySQL? Okay. Uh, question is, would Biggie use PostgreSQL or MySQL? Let me think. Let me think about that. Uh, I mean, Biggie was a hustler, right? So he wasn't actually, you know, at, near the end of his life, he wasn't actually like doing the day-to-day -day deals, right? He have, he'd have his people do it. Um, and Biggie died in what, 94, 95, 96? Uh, so the hot data, so MySQL would have not existed by then. Uh, PostgreSQL, as we know it now, would have not existed because they did a startup for Illustra. Um, the hot database in 1992-93 would have been Sybase, Informix, Oracle. Uh, 1997. Okay, yeah, I should know that. Sorry. Um, yeah, last year was the 25th anniversary. Um, 97 would have been MySQL would have been around. Postgres would have just added SQL support. Um, but he's on the East Coast. So hold up. So that means he can't do Postgres because Postgres is West Coast. Uh, what's an East Coast database? Teradata is at Ohio. That's not East Coast. I actually don't know the answer. Yeah, I didn't, what's, what's, I'm trying to think of what, what's an East Coast database. Uh, I, don't, I don't know the answer. East Coast database from, from the 1997, I don't know. I'll have to get back to you with that one. It's a good question. I win. Any, any other callers? Robert on line four. Go for it. Hey, Andy. Awesome course. Thanks yes. for making it public. Yes. Uh, yep. Why are some databases successful even though they use MLAP instead of their own buffer pools? All right. So the question is, why are some databases successful because they use MLAP instead of their own buffer pools? Can you name one? <laughs> I can think of one. Uh, the only one I can think of is Mongo. Uh, but uh, they, they raised a lot of money, uh, and the very first thing they did with that money, uh, or one of the first things they did with that money, is buy Wired Tiger to get off MMAP. Uh, so the other, the other, the other MMAP databases would be MonadB, but like... Apache Pino. What's that? Apache Pino. Did they, did they use MMAP? Yes. I have to double check that. Now, are they successful though? Are they Snowflake? No. They are, are, are heavily they used in, in production environments in multiple big companies, including LinkedIn. Well, I mean, it, came, it was invented by LinkedIn. Uh, I actually don't know the extent that Pino is using MMAP. I'll have to double check that. But uh, I mean, it's also written in Java too, so there's other, other challenges with that. Look, the... To get something quick, quick and dirty out the door, like the minimal vi pro viable product you want to build for a database system that people are going to start using, uh, you could use MMAP. Uh, because it's similar to what I said before, where like if you choose Postgres, if you're trying to build a startup, no one's going to care what the, you know, what database system you're actually using as long as the app works, right? And so you can almost make the similar argument for MMAP, where like 
if I'm trying to put a data system out there and get people to start using it and getting feedback and, and getting traction, then MMAP would, would, would reduce the amount of time it takes me to build, build that database system. But I would argue that you're going to hit, uh, hit some serious scaling problems and uh, performance issues and, and, and potentially integrity issues if you're doing updates, Pinot's not, um, uh, pretty quickly. And you're going to have to spend time rewriting it. So record this, make this bet. I guarantee you within five years, if Pino is still a thing, they will be, they will be off MMAP. And if I'm wrong, we'll, we'll figure out what the penalty is. Uh, MonaDB is still using MMAP, uh, but that's a transactional system. So they just page everything into memory and then just run off that uh, without doing any updates. Uh, LMDB, that guy loves MMAP uh, more. He loves MMAP as much as I hate it, which is interesting. Um, and for that one, that's an embedded database. It's uh, you know, it's a single writer, so that's how they avoid sort of you know uh, data safety issues. Everybody that's tried MMAP and pushed the system has realized it was a mistake and gotten off it. That includes Influx, that includes MongoDB, SQLite has an MMAP interface, uh, but they do they support that for legacy reasons. Um, the InfluxDB guy came to give a talk at CMU, and he's like, yeah, we're going to use MMAP. And I was like, that's a bad idea. And he's like, oh, we'll see. Came back later. Yeah, it was a bad idea. Um, like, I'm, the, the paper's on the internet with our argument. Uh, I would say, again, any system that gets get, starts getting big and really pushing it, MMAP is going to be a problem. All right. Any questions in the, in the class for you guys? Yes, go for it. Okay. All right. So it's sort of the opposite of what I guess. The, yeah, yeah, I'll say that later. It's the opposite of this. Is like, what is the um, instead, of, instead of the last ten years, what, what's the future? So uh, the, the question is, what's what's the future of database research? I still think we have a way to go for this using ML for databases. Uh, I think that is a you know, the level of sophistication of the ML algorithms are going to get are going to get better over time. Um, whiteboard's terrible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, whatever. All right. Um, I actually been thinking about this myself lately. I I actually I don't know what the next like application area is going to be, right? And I like. The streaming stuff is, is, is there. There seems to be a convergence between like uh, streaming systems and real-time analytics and back-end data warehouses. I think, uh, actually going back to another mistake, I, I think I spent time on what are called HTAP systems or hybrid transactional analytical processing systems where you want to do, you have your transactional system and you want to do some analytics on it. Uh, from a research perspective, that's interesting. From a market perspective, that's a bad idea because People want the best transactional system, the best analytical system. They don't want something that's kind of half good at both. Um, I think that um, I think pushing hardware, the new hardware that comes out uh, with like RISC-V and stuff, I think that's always another direction people could pursue. Um, I think I think making the ML for databases uh, and that kind of automation, I think that's a that's an area I think is not fully like fleshed out just yet. And I think partly because a lot of the academic papers make assumptions about how people could set things up or run experiments or run clones of that in, in practice with auditing, we have not seen be the case, right? That you could take it like a lot of times the papers say like, oh, you're gonna take a snapshot of the database, get a workload trace and run your experiments on that, let train some models and then apply it. That people in practice, that's hard for people to do. And so figuring out ways to automate that is important. I think that the, and then the, the next extension of this would be pushing the, the, the sort of the algorithms or the, the purview of the ML, uh, the ML models or, or the, the controller or the plan or whatever you want to call it up and down the stack. So making it distributed, looking at how you, the data systems can maybe control more of what the, the operating environment looks like, so proper provisioning and so forth, but then also pushing the, some control back into the application itself and changing how we actually have the, the, the application
communicate with, with the, the database. I think that's an area that has not been really thought through, and I, I think it's worth revisiting. So in particular, you think of like serverless applications, right? The, 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 like, uh, you know, the, the Lambda functions. Well, what do they do? You fire some function, and then it has to connect to the database, so then it opens up a connection as if it, like, it's the first time it's ever connected to it, and there's a bunch of back and forth. And I think uh, you know, it doesn't retain any information about what the last time, the last time you called the function, what did it actually do? So there's some, if there's some knowledge you could, you could learn from that about every time I see this function, it's going to evoke and do these things. Could you do prefetching? Could you do caching? Some other optimizations? Could you push some things down? I think that's, that's, a, that's an interesting area. But that, this is just sort of my perspective. Um, I think time series databases are, I think they're sort of well studied and understanding at this point. I don't know. So yeah, so back to your question, I don't know what the next targeted application area that everyone's going to sort of focus on and, and re would require us to rethink how we want to build database systems. The only area I could think of that is ripe for research would be for arrays and matrices. And because that's the only type of data where you, where I would say you don't want to store in a relational database. If it's a graph database, if it's, it's a document store, key value store, all of those things you can store in a relational database. Arrays are actually terrible because you'd have to represent the array, especially a sparse array, as like X, Y coordinates as a separate column and then the actual data. But then the database system engine is, is designed to either do, you know, traverse it as columns, traverse it as rows, and not sort of the multi-dimensional search that you may want in an array. So that's the, there are array databases um, that haven't really taken off. Like Amazon and Microsoft and Google don't offer an array database as a service. Uh, no, as far as I know, no real major businesses are using this. Time series, multi-dimensional time series data looks a little like this. But I think array databases might be the, the new new domain in building new systems. And th there's other, there's TileDB, there's SciDB. There's a bunch of array database systems out there. Pinecone, uh, that's more of a vector search. But I think that might be the right area. But I, I don't know what it is. Other than I know it's not Web3. OK. Wayne, other questions? We have a question, a call-in from Asad. All right, go for it. Hello, Prof. Yes. I, I had a question if there is an application that depends on two different databases. Let's say one RocksDB and one SQLite. What are the general techniques to keep them in sync or have atomic or soft atomic writes as requests come in? Your so your question is, uh, if I have two databases, one was SQLite, one was, uh, one was SQLite, one was RocksDB, okay. and you have writes showing up, how do I keep them in sync? Yeah. Um, or what are the general techniques to keep, to have some sort of atomicity or some sort of synchronization between the two? So, yeah, so the question is, if I have, it doesn't have to be, not even, just like ignore SQLite and RocksDB. I have two separate data systems. They can either be, the same, like the same thing, like Postgres, Postgres, or Postgres, MySQL, Postgres, SQLite, doesn't matter. How do I make sure that they're in sync? Actually, let's take the case where they're not the same because like MySQL and Postgres, they have built-in mechanisms for synchronization. Um, the, the, you need a external controller, a coordinator, to be aware of what transactions are running and what they're trying to do and what, what data that, that they're touching. And that centralized coordinator would be the arbiter of what the of whether or not a transaction is allowed to commit or not. And we talked about this before when we talked about distributed databases, right? There was like the middleware approach or a centralized coordinator, we call it the TP monitor. There are products like Tuxedo, uh, the Ahmed thing from from for, for HBase. There are systems that can do that for you. That you can go to them and say, I want to register my transaction, here's updates I'm, I'm going to make. Then you go make the changes you want, and then you go back to this thing and say, Am I allowed to commit? And if yes, then then you go commit on the different systems. That would be that would be the one way to do this. Um, that would be if you want concurrent updates. A simple thing to do, and oftentimes is is an efficient thing to do, is just have a single thread, single writer. Right? Uh, yeah, everyone goes through a single single queue. You apply all your, your updates. You commit. You're done. And then you do the next one, because then you don't have this overhead of actually going back and forth and deciding you know what's allowed to commit or not. So I, I don't know the exact setup of your application scenario, but that, that would be that would be my recommendation. 
if they're over the wide area network, this of course makes this more tricky. Um, but uh, yeah, you, 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 at the end of the day, you need somebody. Uh, this is actually called. It's also called a federated database, where you basically make a multiple dis distinct, separate implementations of the database system appear to be a single logical one. Uh, so there's, there's, again, there's tools for for these things. All right, we have another questions. We have a caller by the name of Bo Xuan Li. Go for it. Uh, hi, Andy. Yes. Do you, do you know any non-traditional database company that is actually making profit? And do you think like MongoDB and Snowflake will ever be able to make profit? Uh, the question is, is there a non-traditional database company that's making, making money, making a profit? Uh, and would Mongo and Snowflake actually ever make a profit? Um, I actually don't know the financial details of Snowflake and uh, and uh, and Mongo. Like I don't look at like their their SEC filings to say are they profitable or not. Um, other than that, I know they're making a, they have a lot of revenue certainly. Um, yeah, let me think about this. Is, is there a non-traditional database company that? Oh yeah, sure. Um, Mark Logic, uh, Splunk. Uh, those are sort of XML log processing databases from the late '90s, early 2000s. Uh, I think they're publicly traded. I think they're profitable because they've been around for 20 years. Um, no, Splunk is, Splunk is not making profit. They're not making profit. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, again, so like, I don't know the financial details of these companies to say are they profitable or not. Like, that's, I don't, I don't invest in, in into database companies. That isn't because I don't have time to do this. I invest in S&P 500. Uh, let me think of other ones. All the um, this goes back to what I was saying in the very beginning. This NoSQL versus SQL, like there were every 10 years, there's another wave of, of category database systems where they say relational model is stupid, do it our way, and then and then they lose and they either die or they switch the relational model. Uh, so in the late 80s, early two, early 1990s, there was these object-oriented databases because object-oriented programming was a big thing. Um, there was things like O2, uh, Versant, uh, a couple others I can't remember. Like they all died. Uh, so they weren't profitable. And then uh, Sp Splunk and, and MarkLogic, they're late 90s. They're like XML databases. Uh, there were a bunch of others, XML databases at the time. They all died too. Uh, then, or, sorry, the object-oriented databases were hot, and then they died. Relational model was hot again. Then the XML databases came along. They were hot, and they either switched the relational model or they died. Uh, then NoSQL was hot. And then those guys switched to relational model or they died, right? So this consist, you know, repeating trend of people saying relational model is stupid, switch to something else, uh, and they die. So now for the ones that are not doing the relational model, which ones are profitable? And I don't know the answer. And I, but I will say that I know, like, you know, Amazon's making a killing on DynamoDB, although they have relational model too. Um, at this, now it's JSON at this point. Uh, the database market is, is tough. There's a lot of competitors. There's a lot of crappy systems out there, uh, and it's but there's a lot of money, right? You know, there's a reason why Larry Ellison, the founder of Oracle, he owns a Hawaiian island, right? Paid for by databases. It's a lot of money. Uh, Microsoft makes a lot of money with with with, uh, with you know with, with SQL Server and Azure stuff. Like, there's a lot a lot of money here because everyone has database problems. Um, I would not place my bets on a non non relational database system though at this point if you're investing. How about that? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Wayne, other questions? Question from Manoj. Go for it. Uh, hi, hi Andy. Thanks for your classes and uh, videos. So uh, I had a question on uh, so AWS announced something called tone right prevention. Um, so the claim is that uh, uh, if tone rights are happening, they, they are preventing it on like uh, Nitro-based hardware, on EBS and things like that, and and MySQL and all running on RDS can make use of that. Yes. Uh, and they say like uh, they can turn off, we can turn off the double write operations. Could you please explain what that problem is? Or uh, problem I kind of understand, but how? Uh, your general thoughts on this? Uh, so I was this something they, they announced last week at reInvent. Right. Yeah. I, sorry. I, I I was busy with trying to finish the semester. I, I didn't. I didn't look all the announcements. I, so I don't know the exact detail of what what this what they're actually doing. Um, but in general, the torn write problem is when you are 
as we said before, the, there's a Harvard page size of four kilobytes, and then there's like the Davis page size, which could be something larger, which in MySQL I think is 16 kilobytes. So the way MySQL avoids torn updates um, is they use what's called a double write back buffer. And what, what that does is it's almost like a staging area for page updates before you write it to the actual database itself. So again, there's a write ahead log, I write those out sequentially, and then now I'm gonna flush the dirty pages either because of eviction or the background writer. And what they'll do is they'll write those, the, the dirty pages out to this double write back buffer sequentially, commit that, make that durable, right? And then they go write it again to the actual overwrite the, the actual data pages themselves. So to flood, write one page out the disk of MySQL, you have to write it twice. So, because they want to avoid, you know, torn pages, you know, because you can only write durably four kilobyte page writes. So I'm assuming that's the fix that, that they have, is now they have a, you can do atomic writes to pages in EBS that are larger than four kilobytes. And therefore you can turn off the double write back buffer in, in ODB. I'm assuming that's what it is, but I have to go look. So it basically avoids like having to do double writes for, for MySQL. All right, wait, next question. I get a, qu a question from the class actually. Yes, go for it. Are you actually the uh, early proof proof on AutoTune? Okay, the question is, can, can I give a quick pitch on AutoTune? Sure, yes. Um, I have slides, which, <laughs> well, because that means all I ever do is make slides. Um, but this computer seems to be really struggling, so I don't think it's gonna happen. Okay, all right, so Autotune. So database systems are, uh, maybe we'll load, you know, it, 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 are complex pieces of software. And the, there's a lot of decisions to be made about how to actually set, set it up. Okay, this, this is not happening. Um, well, let's see, maybe it does. Zoom is terrible, it's probably Zoom. Um, okay. That was a bad idea, sorry, let me kill this. Yeah, all right, whatever. So, databases are, <laughs> sorry, this is not professional. Uh, and now I can't kill it, whatever, all right. Sorry, databases are complex pieces of software that because of the relational model, because of SQL, the programmer is, is not really supposed to understand the low-level details of how the system is actually storing stuff. But that's not entirely true because, uh, because it, it, the amount of sophistication that you would require, well, the, the, the amount of sort of magic, whether it's machine learning or whatever you want to call it, of, on the data system side to figure out the best way to store your data or execute queries or whatever uh, is, is quite limited. And oftentimes what will happen is as the developers add new features, instead of having like a hard-coded pound-defined constant in the code about like, you know, uh, hash table memory size, they expose it as a, as a knob, right? And because the idea is that someone else who, you know, a DBA or a programmer who knows exactly what the application is trying to do on the database, they'll be in a better position to actually set that knob. But in practice, that doesn't happen because, you know, you're like a random JavaScript programmer you know what a database is, and that's about it, right? Uh, and so the original idea of, of Autotune was that we were going to use machine learning to automatically figure out how to set these knobs, right? So like buffer pool sizes, caching policies, uh, locking policies, and so forth. And, and we would use machine learning to figure out how the application wants to use the, um, use the data system and then be able to set the knob uh, correctly for them, right? And let's see. This is probably a lost cause. Let's see. Cancel. Bad idea. Okay. Um, let me just turn up presenter. I just want to show you how many knobs there actually are and, and show you what AutoTune is actually doing. Slideshow. Turn off uh, that. Uh, oh, oh. Maybe. Uh, so here, this is this is a bit outdated, but here's the number of knobs in Postgres for MySQL. So my PhD student Dana, she just went and looked at the documentation for MySQL Postgres and for like the last 20 years and counted the number of knobs. So the very beginning, they started off with like almost like less than 100. Then MySQL grew by 7x and, and Postgres grew by 5x. So like there's hundreds of these knobs, 
that you could actually tune to set performance. Nobody has actually had to tune them. Now, not all these knobs will pack performance because there'll be things like directories and port numbers or things that like don't actually matter. Um, but th there's enough of them that do matter. So the way people sort of do this now, do it yourself, uh, but there's a bunch of these blog articles that are sometimes wrong. You hire a DBA, but that's expensive. This is a few years ago. The average salary of a DBA in the US is, uh, what is that? Uh, so how about 100,000? Um, or not, sorry, 96,000. There's a bunch of these rule taste things, and our idea is, is use machine learning, right? So Autotune was a project we started at my, with my PhD student uh, about six or seven years ago, where the idea, again, we were going to use machine learning to figure out how to, how to tune these knobs. And the, the way it basically works is that you don't have to make, change any, make any changes to the application. We connect to your, your database, retrieve these runtime metrics, like pages read, pages written, locks held, and then we compute models to say, here's how we expect the, the system's performance will change as we tweak a knob this way versus another way. And then we can reuse the training data we collected from one database and potentially apply it to another one. So that was the original idea of AutoTrain. And basically what happened while we, you know, while Dana was a student, um, blah, 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 right, this is the setup. Right, performance difference you can get, it's actually quite significant. Yada, 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 sorry. So while, while we were a student, while, while Dana was a student, uh, we ended up writing a guest blog article on Amazon's AI blog about Autotune. Because I met the guy that runs, now he runs all of the databases, but he ran all of the ML division at, uh, at Amazon. I just thanked him for giving us $5,000 to run our experiments at EC2. So yeah, I, I took money from Amazon. Uh, so then uh, he's like, great, can you write a blog article for us? We just started the new Amazon AI blog, we need material. So we wrote a blog article that was on you know, the Amazon official blog. And then when this thing came out, we got all these crazy emails from people saying, we have this exact problem. We'll give you money to fly a student out and like set it up for us, right? Like shit like this, right? Uh, anyway, so this happened so many times, we thought clearly there's like a startup idea here. So that's why we then, we forked it off during the pandemic to do a startup. Now, the thing we've learned since we've done, since, since, since we've left the university um, is that the ML algorithms work even better in the real world than they did at the university because we were running like synthetic experiments on like, you know, benchmarks and so forth. But when you get, actually get on real databases, it makes a huge, huge difference. Uh, but the challenge is that there's a lot of other things people are struggling with in databases that uh, go beyond knob tuning, like picking indexes, query tuning. You see people just don't, don't know how to set things up in the cloud or in RDS. Like they're not gonna know, like they turn off backups when they shouldn't. Right, so there's a, the, the, the current version of Autotune, we're expanding beyond the knob tuning and doing a lot of the other things that DBAs would do now. Um, so it's, it's been interesting, sort of straddling both research and, 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 and the startup tech world. Uh, and there's been things that I've learned in the, in the startup where it's not something Autotune could solve right now, but then it does sort of guide how we pursue research back at the university. So an example with this would be like proxies, like like a middleware in front of Postgres that take queries and then route it, route it to Postgres, right? These are way more common than, than I, I realized um, in the real world and uh, Autotune can't solve that, you know, can't do anything with those right now, but this is something one of my PhD students is looking at. So I've enjoyed spending time doing the startup and you know research here at CMU uh, and I sort of see this again, it's a symbiotic relationship. So. We were, for the time, we were like 80% CMU alum uh, at Autotune. Uh, only the last year we've hired, like, starting hiring like, non-CMU students. Um, and surprisingly, 50% from PKU. Uh, a lot of my best students come from PKU, and a lot of them are with us at Autotune. So that's been fun. Um, I've learned a lot, and I think that uh, it's, it's interesting, again, to see how to take research and actually apply it in the real world. Because some of the assumptions you make don't actually match up. I, I overestimated the sophistication of customers in some cases. Some people are like completely clueless, like what, what, what a database is actually doing, right? Uh, and so, you know, the version of version of Autotune was, a bit, you know, it's, it was designed for people that kind of knew what a database actually was actually doing and how to do things correctly, uh, just how to use it correctly and safely. 
uh, we've had to sort of set up more guardrails and make it more approachable. Again, that's classic, like you build something for engineers, but it, you know, it, for, for like for practitioners, which you, you need to build something that's more user friendly. So, uh, yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah. And this, I mean, this is like, again, applying for ML for, for databases. This is why, again, I think it's a hot area. Uh, these systems are very, very complicated, very difficult to, to understand. And I think uh, ML, I think, is the right solution. All right, any more questions? Yes. So his question is, what's the next line of wh how data? Because how is security important for databases? So I always say this. It's going to bite me in the ass. I don't care about security that much until I get hacked, uh, which I sure was going to happen. Um, there's are there are databases that now have native support for encryption, like like the it's data is encrypted at rest. There is some line of work about doing uh, actually running queries on directly on encrypted data. Uh, and still producing correct results, um, like the homomorphic encryption. That area, I don't really know a lot about. Um, I don't know. I, encrypting the data at rest is, is, is the, the main thing you need. You want to you want to you want to do, and a bunch of systems do support that. Um, but where the data breaches often are are not because like someone hacked into your system and got directly to the disk and, and pulled things off, right? It's oftentimes through the the, the front end. Through the application, right, and so the and so encryption is not going to help you with that, right? So Oracle actually does something like this. They they have a uh, they have a thing in their autonomous database offering, which I think is pretty cool, where they see all the SQL requests show up and they try to learn what's the what's the typical pattern of a user for you know for giving like username connection, right, or like a port number, or like location. So then like, if you see someone trying to do a select star query to dump out the entire table at like 2 a.m. and they've never done that before, they'll stop the query and flag it, right? So I think that part is kind of cool. But again, that's, uh, it's, I mean, one, it's Oracle specific, but I think that would solve a lot of issues that you just see unexpected usage patterns f from the application, then you know something's up, right? It's very rare that you, people, it's rare now, it didn't used to always be. Uh, it's very rare that people get direct access to your database. MongoDB used to have a default username password test test. People used to sit there, and still now you can go look on the internet. There's 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 open my, there's open MongoDB port or, you know connections you can log into. Uh, in that case, you know you're fucked. Sorry, you're screwed, right? Like uh, we used to give a demo of showing how to people how to do that with Mongo. It's it's gotten less and less because uh, the new versions obviously fix this, but this is like 10 years ago. There's a bunch of 10-year-old MongoDB databases you can log into on the internet now because with the default username and password. So I think uh, I think encryption, running queries on encrypted data, there's a line of research in that, but I think anomaly detection on the front end is, is, a, is another important thing. Yes? How do you become a, become a data addict? The question is, how do I become a data addict? Um, is addict the right word? Uh, enthusiast? Yeah, probably addict. Um, so, well, there's two things. There's 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 my personal journey, and then there's there's the the, the pitch I'll make about data, databases in general. Like, my personal journey is that like throughout my uh, my career, both in academia and in industry, I found that like databases seem to come naturally to me, in a way that like other people it didn't for other people, and it happened so often that I felt like oh okay maybe this is something I'm I'm really good at, right. And then when I went to grad school, I thought I was going to do distributed systems. Uh, and then this is where, how I end up meeting Mike Stonebreaker. Is like, I was like, okay, we're going to build a distributed database system. And I started working with him on this, with, with Stan Zazonic. Um, and then just it went from there, right? But the pitch I would make for why databases are awesome, is, at least for, for research, is whatever you're interested in, like in, in if it's ML, if it's programming languages, uh, um, algorithms, theory, systems, networking, OSs, you can do it in the context of databases, and people pay you a lot of money for it. Th that's why I think it's awesome. Like everything, end of the day, everything's a database problem. Yeah. I have a problem. Same question. Okay. All right, Wayne. Any other callers? A uh, question. Sorry. A uh, caller named Billy Bob. What line? Line one. Yep. Go Hello, for it. Can you, this is Billy Bob. Can you hear me? Yeah. 
Yeah, I have a question. Uh, my question is that Santa Barbara sucks, and I want to shout out Santa Monica. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pablo. Big All right. fan. All right, thanks. All right, when are the callers? The, the question from you. Yeah, yeah. Hey, hey, Annie. Yes, what's um, up, man? My question is, will you write your next database in Rust? Yeah, the question is, will I write my, write my next database in Rust? Yes, yes. I don't know what it's going to be. I don't know when we're going to do it, but yes, that's the answer. Will it be before Chi graduates? Probably not. We'll probably have to wait till he graduates, but that's okay. But, or, or we fail and he can stick around, right? <laughs> Uh, probably. So the question is, what's so great about Rust? So when we were building Noise Page or prior to that Peloton in C++, just dealing with the memory, who owns it, who you know, when do you when do you when do you uh, you know when do you free it up? We spent so much engineering effort on that; it was a huge pain. And Rust handles that for you because they force you to do it. Like we we invented our, we had a. We invented our own pointer type in, in C++ that where we, we could pass around like a shared pointer, but then we would free it up ourselves, right? Like that's, that's insane. We're making our own, our own smart pointer in, in C++ to, to deal with these issues. Rust doesn't have the problem because they take care of it for you. So that, that, that was the idea, right? Okay, uh, so that's it for the, for the lecture, but I have two important things I want to cover. Uh, we have uh, two major, major announcements. Um, the first is we have the DNA test from your lawyer for, for you here. Uh, I have not seen this. I have, oh, sorry. You, you, you should open it. How did you get this? Well, your lawyer sent it to me, right? To you? Yeah. Did you change, like, my mailing address? No. Well, no hold on, hold on. They, you, you know, you, you had to do it because you're going to court. I, I mean, yeah, but, like, why did they send it to you? Exactly, yeah. What does it say? Says that the probability of cocaine. I oh am shit! Not the father. Nice. <laughs> Congrats. <laughs> All right, and then the other hot thing we have also too. Let me get sure to see this on camera. Yeah, is uh, you won an award. Have you seen this? From Carnegie Mellon, DJ Bushu won Most Dank Course DJ of 2022 at all Carnegie Mellon. So, uh, do a quick photo. Congratulations. There you go. Wait, get the photo. Hold up. Wait. Like, yeah. Look at that. Awesome. Again, I appreciate you spending time with us through all your troubles. Uh, Thank you for everyone for the semester. It's been fun. Finish up project four, and then I'll see everyone on the final exam. We'll have coffee, donuts, and cigarettes on Friday at class. So if you want to show up a little early, uh, you can have a little, little break, okay? All right, guys. Good luck. Best semester.